Hello there, welcome to this edition of Global Business Africa. In the course of the hour, we'll run through all the key business news stories you need to know about from right across the continent. Let's start though with the run through the markets. Some interesting numbers and trends coming through here. A very keen focus on Egypt, closing higher today. The only one among the ones we track here that actually did that. But even at these levels, it's about 12-13% uh, in the red so far in the year. The NAC 20 flirting again with a low that it's hit that essentially is a bit of a 10-year low. 27.54, this is about five or so points off a low that it's hit for that particular period of time. We'll see if this trend continues in the course of the week. Here's what's coming up tonight. Inflation in Zimbabwe rises to a new 10-year high. We'll explore why. The British Prime Minister sets the third week of January as the date for the Brexit vote deal. And basket weavers in Ghana are all set for big gains as the Christmas season picks up. All right, then let's start tonight in Zimbabwe with a focus on inflation. It soared to a fresh 10-year high, a very painful number coming up at the moment. The cost of living in the country was up 31% year on year in November from 20.8% in October. Now, that was triggered by a spike in the price of basic goods, especially foods, amid an acute shortage of dollars that has made imports a hell of a lot more expensive. Now, on a monthly basis, prices are up by over 9% in November compared to a jump of 16.4% in October. The Zimbabwean dollar, if you want to call it that, or zollars as it's commonly known, has essentially lost its value against US dollars. Now, according to analysts, that's essentially because there are more electronic dollars, quote-unquote, floating around in the banks than actual US cash dollars available. Central bank data shows that there's some $10 billion electronically running around in bank accounts, but less than actually $250 million available in hard cash. Let's head over to West Africa now. Nigeria is among the oil-producing countries that have committed themselves to cutting output from January in OPEC's attempts to push up prices. But there seems to be no guarantee that the intended high prices will actually be achieved. CGTN's Phil Ihaza looks at the impact of this decision on Africa's largest single economy. Global oil prices have dipped by about 30% over the last two months, hovering around the $50 per barrel mark. A move by OPEC member countries to reduce daily oil production is targeted at reducing the surplus quantity of the product on the international market and boosting the price. As a result, beginning from January 2019, Nigeria, one of the world's top 10 crude oil exporters, will be looking to cut around 44,000 barrels from its 1.7 million barrel daily production. However, the development has increased pressure on budgets in oil exporting countries like the West African nation. The price of oil as it goes down will affect the, 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 the benchmark, will also affect the amount of Naira that the budget should be based on. Over 8 trillion Naira, if the benchmark is lower than expected, it means that the deficit will be high. If deficit is high, who will give you the money? At what rate will the person give you the money? And how do you pay back? Oil is Nigeria's economic mainstay, and for now, the country needs to sell as much oil as possible to plug its budget and restore economic growth. But some experts say Africa's largest economy should not be so dependent on oil as a source of revenue. It is unfortunate that uh, year in year out we look at the pricing of oil in order to determine how our economy will go on. But at the same time we say that uh, our economy has gotten far away from oil, which is not true because uh, over 90% of our forex comes from oil. Nigeria should, whether it likes it or not, to stop thinking oil and start thinking manufacturing, industrialization, service industry, innovative enterpr enterprises, and uh, encouraging small, business, small businesses to, to use creative minds. The drop is expected to remain in place for an initial six-month period until June 2019, except for a possible review in the month of April by OPEC countries. The World Poverty Club reports that nearly half of Nigeria's 200 million population currently lives in extreme poverty. The country's economy suffered a downturn in 2016 due to a global slump in oil price, and experts say the government may need to do more and quickly to prevent the economy from slipping back into recession. Phil Ihaza, CGTN Abuja, Nigeria. 
Let's return briefly to our lead story. Headline inflation in Zimbabwe hitting levels we've not seen in about 10 years. 31% is a relevant number and a 9% jump on a month-on-month -month basis. Let's see how the country is faring at this point in time. Farai Mukhtar joins us now live from Zimbabwe's capital with more dates on this story. So, uh, Farai, between October and November, prices up 9.2%. That's a huge jump in prices. But is it mostly a reflection of the scarcity of goods and hard cash right across the economy? Can I answer? Well, Rama, certainly what we are seeing here is a manifestation of those shortages of basic commodities that have been experienced here over the last couple of months. However, it is fundamentally a result of a shortage of foreign currency, a crippling currency crisis that Zimbabwe is in the midst of and in the throes of right now, where the US dollar is effectively being traded as a commodity in itself. Now, if you look back to the period we're talking about here, October, November, that is the time when the parallel market rate for US dollars spiraled and peaked. Uh, at a high of about 500 to 600 percent that was in october and that was attributed that is what's attributed to the rise in inflation in that period it started to say stabilize and come down in november but it was still high and so that is why we are seeing uh, those figures for inflation uh, the rate of increase in prices certainly month on month came down from about 16.4 percent in october to about nine percent 9.2 percent in november so the rate of price increases is coming down but the rate of inflation is is still very much high and is likely to continue as we go into December now where we expect that festive boom and demand for products and services to increase inflationary pressure. We also know that civil servants are in for a 13th check, albeit a, a lower amount and more modest, but certainly that will apply and, and exert more inflationary pressures. Finance Minister Mtuli Ngube has projected that uh, inflation will end the year at about 25.9%. Not sure if uh, you know that is feasible given what we're seeing now. Uh, more more inflation it's, it's likely to go higher uh, and so that 25.9 percent projection might be out the window but we'll wait to see what happens in december and if indeed uh, zimbabwe is able to claw back these rates of inflation tame inflation and and, and bring it down rama indeed we'll have to leave it there for the time being that's for i'm there live in harare now still in the general south and african region the south african retailer edcon limited is in talks with Shopping mall owners about a two-year 41% rent reduction in exchange for a 5% stake in the business. Now, the company, of course, has been grappling with an over-leveraged capital structure for several years now. In 2014, troubles in its credit business coincided with an economic slowdown and a weak consumer spending cycle in its main market, South Africa. Main Capital gave up equity control of the company last year to a range of creditors, including the fund manager Franklin Templeton and local lenders, including Standard Bank and ABSA. Edcon is one of the biggest names in South African retail. It employs more than 14,000 permanent full-time staff in over 1,100 stores. Very painful news there. Right then, so in our company news wrap, let's start in the oil sector. A judge in Italy says that there is evidence showing that any and Royal Dutch Shell, the oil majors, were aware that their 2011 purchase of a Nigerian oil field would result in corrupt payments to Nigerian politicians and officials. The Milan judge made that comment in handing down her reasons for the September conviction of a Nigerian and an Italian who are both middlemen in the deal around OPL245. The deal was purchased, the block rather, was purchased by Italy's Eni and Shell for $1.3 billion. Still in commodities, the Glencore controlled mining company and some of its current and former executives have agreed to pay more than $22 million in settlement fines. Now that refers to allegations in Canada that they hid the risks of doing business with an Israeli close to the Congolese president, the outgoing Congolese president should point out, Joseph Kabila. This was between 2014 and 2016. The Ontario Securities Commission is expected to name several of the Toronto-listed Katanga Mines current and former executives as part of that settlement. That could be announced sometime this week. In tech, the US high-end chipmaker Qualcomm has rejected Apple's attempt to solve a dispute by updating software. Now, that comes after a court in China granted the US chipmaker an injunction against Apple that could block the sales of several older iPhone models. At the heart of this dispute is whether or not Apple violated and is violating Qualcomm patents by refusing to pay billions of dollars in tech licensing payments. And finally, an American plane manufacturer, Boeing, has delivered its first jetliner that's been 
fully assembled at an overseas facility, this one in the southeastern Chinese city of Zoshan. The 737 MAX delivery marks the opening of a joint production plant established by Boeing and its Chinese partner, the Commercial Aircraft Corporation of China. Boeing has forecast demand for new aircraft in China at 7,700 units over the next 20 years. Total value, 1.2 trillion US dollars. That's a run through your headlines. Right then, there's a lot more content coming your way. We're back in 60. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global Business, only on CGTN. Every story starts out like this. Okay. Beyond the rush of the numbers, there's always a more fundamental question. What happened? Who has been affected? When market moving decisions are made, who's responsible? And why? Let's get some reaction on ground. Joining us in Johannesburg is Central. Hello, Nairobi. This is how all stories begin. See how they end. Only on Global Business. Welcome back to the program. You're watching Global Business Africa. Now, barely a week ago, the United States National Security Advisor, John Bolton, announced the broad outline of a new engagement strategy for the U.S. with economies here in Africa. Now, the bulk of the speech, though, focused on something entirely different. It focused on what China and Russia are doing on the continent. Great power competitors, namely China and Russia, are rapidly expanding their financial and political influence across Africa. They are deliberately and aggressively targeting their investments in the region to gain a comp competitive advantage over the United States. China uses bribes, opaque agreements, and the strategic use of debt to hold states in Africa captive to Beijing's wishes and demands. Its investment ventures are riddled with corruption, and do not meet the same environmental or ethical standards as U.S. developmental programs. All right, then. So John Bolton there with a very if or framing. Now, here's what didn't get as much attention as those sound bites. There was an announcement somewhere in there that the Trump administration intends to negotiate new trade deals with economies here in Africa on a bilateral basis. Now, granted, you'd be forgiven for missing that because the focus on trade was, and I'm not kidding about this, just 2% of that entire speech. Earlier on, I spoke to Nzetse Were, she's a Kenyan economist. I asked her how productive this Cold War style framing would really be. During the Cold War, people didn't even know what we were and what we were doing. They were like, who are these newly independent countries? What are they? We don't understand them. Um, but I think now, because of the China issue, because other parts of the world, developing economies are also moving into Africa, there's a lot more of a global um, awareness of the importance of Africa. Yeah. Um, and I think if um, any governments that seem to be taking sides, they will, one, have to really justify it, and I think they'll get pushed back either way, and number two, they'll be, they'll be asked serious questions as to whether they're putting their lands up for proxy war or uh, geographical location. Right. Again, going back to the internal contradictions and what John Bolton said, on one hand, you say, well, we'd like to engage a lot more through commerce, through trade, through investments with economies on the African continent, but on the other hand, you're 
putting up this carrot and stick approach. Um, and here we are with this tool called AGOA that has a lot more potential to grow. Because on the other hand, you look at what the EU is doing with the EPAs, that's particularly interesting. You look at what's happening, uh, the sort of bilateral negotiations and trade that we're seeing between China and economies on the continent, that's moving in a particular direction. But AGOA seems frozen in time. Wasn't this a missed opportunity? to essentially reform. Okay. I absolutely agree with you. I mean, I think that was one of the biggest um, questions that was there is what about to go? And I think that was deliberate. Mm -hmm. uh, I think once this new administration came in, the immediate concern Africans were having is will this be renewed? What's going to happen to Ogoa? And I think the fact that there was silence on that either indicates that there's not very good news or that's still, still being discussed. So I or think, no one cares. Oh, yeah, or either. Okay. Whichever way you look at it, though, I think they deliberately didn't put it in there. I didn't think it was an oversight. Um, and so that's what I was just saying, is that all these, all these strengths that the U.S. has in there on the continent just didn't feature front and center. And I think it was a misstep, partly because it almost came across as though the uh, Bolton, first of all, he's a security advisor. And yeah. so you're sort of wondering what a security advisor is doing announcing foreign policy on Africa. There are plenty of very that competent... That should have come from the State Department. Thank you. you know, and, they're, and they're also, the, the other reality is the United States government mm -hmm. has a lot of very seasoned professionals who have worked on the continent, who have been ambassadors, who understand the continent. So there was a lot of room for that to come from a more neutral from a more neutral part of the U.S. government. So the fact that they positioned it under security, I think, was also a bit of a concern. Right. So let's, let's do the State Department homework for them. Let's assume, for argument's sake, we're trying to essentially expand those issues that you mentioned. We want more trade with the United States, we want more investment to flow in both directions. What do we need to do to AGOA now to make it match, for argument's sake, something like the EPAs that have mm -hmm. been negotiated by the EU? Well, I think one of the practical things they could have done is give a lot more to support to, to export promotion councils in African governments. I think if you look at the AGOA uh, sort of dynamic in Africa, a lot of it has to do with private sector not knowing how to use it. And I think the national governments in Africa have having a very tough time deploying the sort of technical capacity building required to get African private sector to comply to all the standards that will then allow those goods into the market. So a very easy thing that they could have done is says we're just going to do this ramp out this program that will work with African governments and other parties to make sure African private sector know how to better leverage, you know, or go to the benefit because the tariff lines exist. You know, it's just that we're not we're not making use of them as Africans. So that would have been, I think, a very useful. So that is, is a main barrier, for lack of a better word, to direct trade between the U.S. and economies here. Is it more of a tariff issue or is it more of non-tariff barriers in combination with the fact that we just don't know how to get access to essentially meet what standards we need to meet, for instance, to be able to export sugar yeah. or coffee or I think cotton? It's, a, it's definitely non-tariff barriers. Mm. And I think even if you look at Kenya, of the thousands of tariff lines, I think we, we use under 50 of them. Mm. Um, so I think there's just a fundamental lack of understanding and I think a lack of requisite technical and technological capabilities to ensure that we're pushing our markets into a goa. Mm. And I think particularly in the context of the U.S.-China war, um, uh, trade war, should I say, the, the reality is that Africa is being seen as a more useful a location to get your goods into into the USA and you sort of tariff hop, tariff hop from Chinese investment, you put it in Africa, then you get your tariff benefits through a Goa. So there are all these things um, that I think Africans can leverage. Opportunities and risks. Now, if you are a regular on African Twitter accounts, this is a story you're very familiar with. You probably had a front row to it, especially if you're in South Africa. The country's former president, Jacob Zuma, is a late arrival to the platform called Twitter. But ever since he joined last week, he is not holding back. In three days, he's got 100,000 people falling over there. He's put up two videos and a string of, um, shall we say, entertaining tweets. CGTN's Ulysses and Jamela has more. Hello, everyone. Uh, I have decided to move with times to join <clears throat> this important area of conversation because I hear that uh, many people are talking about me as well as all as others are calling themselves Zuma in many ways. I felt it is necessary that I should join in and be part of the conversation and join the people in their discussions. It's me, the former president, Jacob Zuma. And that is how the former president made his grand entrance to social media, specifically Twitter. The former president accumulated over 
80,000 followers in just over a day after making his social media debut. But some people were quite doubtful whether it's a real account or it's actually a parody account. And he quickly corrected that. Uh, I hear that uh, some people are doubting whether I have joined uh, the social media. Yes, it is me. I have. It is real. And I'm sure it's going to take time for people to get used uh, to me being part of uh, the conversation in the social media. <clears throat> and I know that, of course, some people have been using some fake uh, accounts on behalf, I mean, on my name. Uh, but now it's me. I'm there. The former president says the platform will afford him the possibility to respond to fake news and other views. And he has thus far illustrated that. Some social media experts say it's long overdue. The former president of the state is a brand himself for fact that he was the president of the state and he was the ANC president. He's a brand himself. So we might not know the motive, um, but it's, it can be a way of him engaging with the people because then he never had an opportunity because maybe of the busy, uh, uh, the busy schedule that he could not engage with the community uh, at that particular time. But now because he has free time, he is able to, 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 to use social media to engage with the people. Leroforo says while the video confirms that it is indeed Zuma's account, no one can be entirely sure if he actually runs it personally. Again, Twitter is a very quick social media platform where the news moves faster and, um, um, uh, you know, for him to be able to narrate his um, message to the people. But also, the most important thing is the content and the context. The question can be, is it really him who's tweeting for himself? That's the bottom line. Despite that assertion, Lerufora is adamant that many people actually take this account seriously and are keen to engage the former president. People definitely take the account serious because he's the former president of the country and some people wanted to engage with him because, I mean, pres uh, the former president is the center of controversy of what happened in the country before. So people need answers. And Twitter can be a platform for them to engage with him so that he is able to, res to respond to questions that were not answered before. Zuma has been at the helm as South Africa's president for just under a decade. His tenure was marred with controversy including corruption and fraud charges laid against him. Perhaps he might also use this platform to tell his side of the story far from the courts of the law. You listen to Jamila for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Still in South Africa, the country has held its first ever Cannabis Expo, which brought together local and multinational companies from the cannabis industry. Uh, enthusiasts, activists, medical researchers are all spoiled for choice and knowledge at this event. CGTN's Ulysses and Jamela was there. The Cannabis Expo provides the perfect platform for international and local medical health professionals, agricultural providers and lifestyle brands to engage with industry experts and the public around the versatile plant. This is the largest trade and consumer expo of its kind on the African continent. It features local and international experts from the cannabis industry. Over 50 exhibitors are here. One of them is Matiti Trish Gabi of Aloken Cannabis Business. She's from the kingdom of Lesotho and operates from that country. In 2017, Lesotho became the first African nation to legalize the growth of cannabis for medicinal and research purposes. We are licensed operator and we grow from the local land raised strains from Lesotho and we have production for three hectares under greenhouse and shade nets for the strains that we grow. For Kabi, getting involved in the cannabis industry was born out of a personal challenge. 15 years or so back, 
Our third born child had uh, to undergo operation from which he ended up developing epilepsy. And we learned that one of the active ingredients in Epilim, the medicine for epilepsy, it's a synthetic component of CBD, which is also part of the cannabinoids in the cannabis plant. So we started to undertake research in that area and we ended up getting the license and now are operational from growing to a oil extraction to product manufacturing for all types of different ailments. All their products displayed here are homegrown. The findings indicate that some of the strains have an exceptional cannabinoid called THCV, which tetra, is, which is tetra hydrocannabivarine. It is commonly referred to as the Rolls Royce of cannabinoids because it treats different ailments, mainly obesity and uh, heart conditions and you know balancing of uh, the sugar levels. All these have been produced from Lesotho grown cannabis. For instance here, this is some of our topical salves. This is a arthritis and rheumatic pain salve relief. So this is very good for joint and arthritis pains for people that have got such kind of ailments. This expo has been phenomenal for Alokan business. We have had so much exposure. We have had so many people that have been requesting that we supply them with a product to an extent that already some have already started to send us emails to the effect that they would like to get off-take agreements with us. A number of people that have been here have already indicated that expressed interest. This has indeed a, a been a huge exposure for us. The four-day expo ends on Sunday. You listen to Jamela for CGTN in Pretoria, South Africa. Right then, from the southern end of the continent to the northern side of it now. Egyptian management group Oraskum has been awarded the tender for the management and the running of the newly developed Pyramid Plateau. The Ministry of Antiquities has been refurbishing the area around the Grand Pyramid to be well equipped for an increasing number of visitors coming to see these ancient wonders. CGTN's Yasser Kim has more. The Pyramid Plateau has long been in need of a makeover. A plan to develop the area has finally been put in place. We have moved the entrance away from the current location next to the main house hotel to El Fayum High Road, where it's much larger, with a huge parking space for the buses and cars. We built a lounge for the visitors with a cinema complex that shows documentaries about the area. There is an antiquities awareness school for the students, and all transportation inside will be through electric vehicles to avoid pollution. The $25 million development is meant to make the visit to the pyramids a more comfortable and enjoyable experience. The Ministry of Antiquities is in charge of the project, but to ensure the best possible service, it has relinquished management to the private sector. Renowned Egyptian group Orascom won their tender to develop the area. We as Egyptologists, we are very clever in digging. We are, as uh, conserv conservators, we are really great in conservation, in consolidations, in working. But we are not good in serving tourists. It's not our turn. It's not our job. So that's why we decided to get the private sector to help us and to do the offers, those kind of service to the tourists. But who is controlling the area? We, as the Supreme Council of Antiquities. Officials say the private sector is better equipped to manage the facilities here. However, security will be the responsibility of the state. There are 20 to 25,000 visitors every day to the pyramids. The Supreme Council has strict conditions that the security remains with the government to ensure that the ancient treasures are safe and are not tampered with. But all other services like the new bazaars, horse and camel riding, Foods and drinks will be provided by Orasco. The ambitious project, 10 years in the making, is expected to attract more visitors to the only remaining wonder of the seven wonders of the world. It should be inaugurated in early 2019. Yes, Hakim for CGTN, Cairo. All right, then time for a short break here on the program. Plenty more coming up, including this. The 30th of January has been set as a date to vote on a deal that Theresa May has negotiated with the EU. The major economic powers are taking aim at the US at the World Trade Organization Forum. We'll have the details on that and lots more next.
business in Africa is at a crossroads. We celebrate those who are adopting and thriving despite the challenges, from grassroots to big businesses. Global Business takes you along for the ride as we track the making of a giant. Only on CGTN. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back. It's 1831 GMT. You're watching Global Business Africa. These are the stories making your headlines at this hour. Let's start in Ethiopia, where more than 20 people have been killed in ethnic clashes in the southern end of the country. Fighting is said to have broken out between Somalis and Oromos in Moyale. It's a town that pretty much cuts right across the border with Kenya. Hundreds have fled. A renewed wave of attacks by, ICE, by an ISIL-leaning faction of Boko Haram is becoming a huge concern for leaders in the Lake Chad Basin. That group has killed more than 100 Nigerian soldiers and they continue to launch more deadly attacks on military installations across the northeast. The engineering company of the ninth batch of Chinese peacekeeping forces in the city of Wa in uh, South Sudan recently passed an inspection of the equipment by the UN mission in Andri. During the inspection, UN officials examined the vehicles, machinery, arms and self-sustainment services of the Chinese peacekeeping unit. And finally, the British Prime Minister Theresa May has rescheduled a delayed vote in Parliament on her Brexit plan to January. That statement came after the Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn said his party would call a no-confidence vote in the Prime Minister. A largely symbolic move, though, to step up pressure on Theresa May. That's a run through your headlines. All right, then let's jump into that story in a bit more detail. So the UK Prime Minister says that the delayed vote, the one she called off at the 11th hour last week uh, on the Brexit deal that she's negotiated between her government and the EU, that vote will be held on the 14th of January. The vote is supposed to take place last week, but the Prime Minister cancelled it at the last minute when it became clear that lawmakers would shut, uh, shout, essentially shoot it down. Now, May's trying to win tweaks, amendments, if you will, from the EU in order to win over sceptical lawmakers, although the bloc says no renegotiation and this time is possible. Mr Speaker, when we have the vote, when we have the vote, members will need to reflect carefully on what is in the best interests of our country. I know that there are a range of very strongly held personal views on this issue across the House, and I respect all of them. But expressing our personal views is not what we are here to do. We asked the British people to take with just 32 voting against. And the British people responded by instructing us to leave the European Union. Similarly, similarly 438 current members of this House voted to trigger Article 50 to set to set the process of our departure in motion, with only 85 of today's members voting against. Now, we must honour our duty to finish the job. I know, I know this is not everyone's perfect deal. It is a com perfect deal. It is a compromise. But if we let, let the perfect be the enemy of the good, then we risk leaving the EU with no deal. The UK Prime Minister speaking there in the House of Commons. Now, onto trade issues. Major economic powers have taken aim at the US at a World Trade Organization forum. Washington has been accused of abandoning its leadership role for the sake of self-interest and nothing more. The latest US audit turned especially hostile, with nation after nation blasting a raft of tariffs and other measures implemented by the country's president. 
Donald Trump now speaking after the speaking first after the U.S. presentation. Chinese ambassador to the WTO, Zhang Xingcheng, said that the U.S. was not honoring its obligations as the world's largest economy. The 164-member WTO has been one of many fronts where the U.S.-China trade row has been playing out. Plans to replace the ousted former CEO, Carlos Ghosn, by Nissan's board are underway. The company's management says it's establishing a special committee for improving governance, as well as an advisory committee to propose a replacement. However, there is no deadline by which a successor must be named. The former CEO is still in custody. He's facing financial misconduct charges after being arrested on the 19th of November. The Japanese carmaker is also being indicted for its role in the scandal. As speculation rises over the delayed replacement, Renault's interim chairman Philippe Lagayette says that its board too has not yet considered replacing Gone. Nissan's chair, Sai Kawa, says that Renault and Mitsubishi are working hard to, quote, have the same level of understanding, end of quote, on the matter. <laughs> To ensure sufficient independence, objectivity and expertise, I expect the special committee to make recommendations based on these factors. Three external board members and four experts outside the company are joining this special committee. We have to rush. However, we need to ensure sufficient discussion. Before the end of March, we will receive the recommendation by the special committee. We will go through the process carefully. I am not going to ask them to rush. The governance committee's discussion should be considered, and even if it is not determined by the end of March, it is fine. What was found through the internal investigation was done primarily here at Nissan. I acknowledge the fact that we need to work hard so that the board members of the two companies, Renault and Mitsubishi, will have the same level of understanding. Having said that, the type of information that could be provided as mentioned in the past is limited to the results of our internal investigation alone due to the ongoing investigation. However, to share the seriousness of the misconduct that was carried out, this case was significant enough, and I am prepared to give explanations at any given time. Still on the transportation sector, let's talk about Faraday Future. It's a California-based electronic vehicle company that's backed by a range of Chinese investors. It's in financial turmoil again. Facing insolvency this year, the Hong Kong-based uh, Evergrande Healthcare came to its rescue with a billion-dollar injection. But now that relationship seems to have strained and Faraday's future once again looks very murky. Mark New takes a look at the rise and fall of an electric car company badly in need of a recharge. January 2016, at the world's largest consumer electronics show, CES, tech startup Faraday Future comes out of stealth mode, unveiling a concept EV that claims to produce 1,000 horsepower. With 750 employees hired globally and plans to open a manufacturing facility in Nevada, it's full speed ahead. One year later at CES, it holds the show's most dramatic event, showing how some of the world's fastest cars, like a Ferrari, can't compare to the acceleration of its new prototype, the FF91. Test drives bear that out. Hold on. Okay. To build a really well-performing car, a fast car, takes a lot of work. I would rather have engineers that know how to build a really cost-effective car that can drive cost out I think that the odds are definitely stacked against Faraday Future ever, ever getting any volume production. But at their 2017 event, when Faraday Future's main financial backer, La Eco founder Zhao Ye Ting, appeared on stage to push the auto park button, nothing happened. More car trouble lingered, with construction firms accusing Faraday of failing to pay them as its Nevada factory stalled. You feel fully confident that you're we, on track? We feel fully confident. It's not how well you do in the good times. It's how you push through the, the challenges and barriers that come at the harder times. Samson recently quit, meaning two of its three co-founders are now gone, leaving only Laico founder Ja to preside over the company. Ja's Laico has already crashed and burned after having glitzy U.S. events, promising phones, VR, electric cars, and a massive Silicon Valley campus called EcoWorld. And this is what Loico's Silicon Valley office looks like today. The doors are locked, the lights are out, and nobody's inside. The building is now available for lease. But cash-strapped Faraday Future was thrown a lifeline when Chinese conglomerate Evergrande Health stepped in to pledge $2 billion in funding. 
It wasn't long before Evergrande accused Faraday Future of undermining its shareholder rights and withheld funding, prompting Faraday Future to issue a statement saying Evergrande failed to make any of the promised additional payments beyond the original $800 million investment. People were given two choices, either continue to work and, and not get paid or just go home. There was no, there's no, there's no money coming through. From the folks I know at Faraday Future is, they're hopeful. They, they really expect that there's going to be a relief coming through the courts to get them ongoing funding. Coates says the employees that remain still hold out hope that the car they've built will someday hit the market, perhaps beating the odds by proving Faraday has a future. Mark New, CGTN, San Francisco. Shenzhen's transformation over the last four decades has made it a poster child in more ways than one for reform, economic reform in China. The city has been dubbed China's Silicon Valley thanks to tech giants like Huawei and DJI all setting up there. But what is it that makes that city so special? CGTN's Gamefei went there to find out. Bigger than ever, this is the latest agriculture drone released in Shenzhen, China Silicon Valley on December the 4th. With an all-weather data image, Behind all of these innovations is the dedication of hundreds of engineers. Li Xinlong is one of those at DJI, the world's largest drone maker. I spent half a year traveling across China to collect the data of different crops. It's hard, but you're kind of participating in a great cause of modernizing and reforming the traditional agriculture production mode. It makes me proud. Innovations from Shenzhen are gradually changing China, and Li says that's why he chose to come to the city two years ago. I love Shenzhen because this is an innovative and etc. It's weird, but this is Shenzhen. Forty years ago, the garage culture in California Silicon Valley led to the birth of Apple and Microsoft. And now, the passion of young Chinese engineers also makes companies like Huawei and DJI world technology leaders in Shenzhen. Uh, DJI's success came about because we gathered a group of like-minded young talents who did not pursue capital and short-term interests. Instead, they kept advancing the techniques and wanted to fill in the technical gaps. It's the innovation spirit of the tens of thousands of engineers at DGI which made the company what it is today. And it's also that same spirit of the millions in Shenzhen which keeps the city moving. Du Yifei, CGTN, Shenzhen. Still in China, Xiaogang Village is known as the birthplace of rural reforms in the country. As CGTN Omar Khan now tells us, after 40 years of reform and opening up, the village has still seen a substantial transformation. Xiaogang village in eastern Chinese Fengyang County was the first in China to implement a household responsibility system, under which land was leased to families in return for the delivery of fixed output quotas. In 1978, the total amount of grain production in the village was only around 148,000 tons. But after decades of rural reform, the total amount reached nearly 750,000 tons in 2017, around five times more than 40 years ago. The pioneers of the household responsibility system say that the primary purpose of the rural reform is to increase the added value of land through land transfer and distribution. We transferred our land to enterprises at 800 yuan per mu. Our farmers' incomes did not decrease, and we could liberate our labor force to do other things. For example, in my case, I can spend more time opening a restaurant or crafting local specialties. I can even work in an enterprise to earn a wage. All these are measures we took to increase farmers' incomes. Officials say that in order to enhance the development levels of modern agriculture in Xiaogang, China's Ministry of Science and Technology has approved to establish a new project, a modern agricultural science and technology park. 
This project has just been issued, and it's about to be implemented. After the implementation of this project, the current technical level of grain production and agricultural production, as well as the technical level of agricultural processing, will be greatly improved. We will use new technology, new materials, and new products to promote prosperity. Xu believes that Xiaogang village is not only limited to agricultural development, but can also be reinforced in many other aspects. In the past, we only engaged in agriculture, but now we also develop tourism, sales, and we push Xiaogang village to open to the world through an online presence. And in terms of future rural reforms, Yen says the key to agriculture are the mechanisms. Only new mechanisms can help reduce the burden on farmers and increase their incomes. Therefore, we must continue to deepen reforms. The great reform leads to great developments, and small reform leads to small developments. It's difficult to achieve developments without reform. Forty years on, and just like Yen believes, rural reforms are bound to continue across China. Omar Khan, CGTN. All right, then a quick run through commodity prices here for you. So let's start with the oil. Brent for January delivery, that's back under $60 a barrel, at least by 18.20 GMT. The number we're looking at there on the price is about 59.64, uh, down about a percentage point or so, uh, so far today. Cocoa, on the other hand, having a very interesting season. Delivery so far uh, at around 820,000 or so tons, compared out to about 665, 666,000 over the same period this time last year. But broadly speaking, commodities having an absolutely torrid fourth quarter. The Bloomberg Commodities Index falling today. It's heading for its worst close since June 2017. Here's what's coming up next. Basket weavers in Ghana all set for big gains as the holiday season kicks in. There's more to this place than just glorious landscapes. There's more to it than just, say, Table Mountain or glorious, endless salt flats. There's more to it than countries that are home to some of the deepest mines in the world. There is so much more to this place even if it is home to some of the finest diamonds on the planet. It is the sheer diversity of the people who call South Africa home and the relentless drive to make it a better place that make it so special. And we know that because this too is home. No one knows South Africa like we. CGTN. See the difference. Images may appear to be identical, but looks can be deceiving. The difference is not always obvious. It has to be discovered. There are always different sides to a story. We put the focus on the details. To see more, to understand better. CGTN. See the difference. Welcome back. Saffron farmers in southern Morocco have long taken deep pride in the coveted spice that they produce from the purple petaled crocus sativus. But some are now worried about knockoff versions that are threatening their business. Here's CGTN's Terry Wangari with more on Grassroots tonight. Saffron farming in southern Morocco has remained largely unchanged for centuries. The flower requires drastic climate conditions, hot summers and cold wet winters and can only be harvested during a month-long window from mid-October to mid-November. The purple blooms are picked before they fully open to ensure quality. Once dried and sorted, the flower's crimson stigmas and styles are turned into saffron, the world's most expensive spice, popular with top chefs across the globe. Here we are sure it's real saffron. In Belgium, we are not really sure. For me, it's very special because I have only seen saffron in food packets, but not with the flowers like here in the fields. It's very special for me. 
The spice is both a source of pride and a lifeline in this part of Morocco, which along with a neighboring town produces 90% of the kingdom's saffron. Some 1,500 families depend on sales from the crop to survive. But the rise of counterfeit saffron is tarnishing the country's reputation and its designation of origin label, or PDO, which guarantees a product's origin and uniqueness. Saffron specialists came here to do some tests and they told us that our saffron is first class. In other regions, the saffron is second or third rate. In the production stage, there are very strict conditions for the saffron cooperatives to get the label of protected designation of origin for Toulouan saffron. Saffron's rarity and its painstaking cultivation help explain its price. It takes nearly a kilogram of flowers to create 12 grams of the spice. In Morocco, PDO-certified saffron sells for about $3.50 a gram. Counterfeit saffron, however, can sell for less than a dollar a gram. The counterfeiting that affects saffron is a recurring problem, which does only affect farmers in the cooperatives, but it mainly affects the people who sell saffron in the souks, as the Sunday market of Agadir, and in Casablanca where saffron is sold in plastic bags or envelopes. Morocco is the world's fourth largest producer of saffron behind Iran, India and Greece, according to the figures published in 2013. The government is now working with cooperatives and local farmers to ban counterfeit saffron and protect the rare coveted spice. Terry Wangari, CGTN. In Ghana, craftsmen traditionally look to the holiday season as a time for bumper sales for their handmade uh, cane and bamboo baskets. Now, customers often buy these baskets to make hampers and present those as gifts. This year, though, basket weavers say a downturn in Ghana's economy has translated to really mediocre sales. CGTN's Nabil Ahmed Rufai filed a support from Accra. Craftsmen here produce various forms of artworks using locally grown materials like cane and bamboo. Kwejo Adumako has worked here for over 20 years, weaving baskets and other items. Traditionally, the Christmas season is a time for him to increase production, but he says he won't do so this year for fear he won't get enough customers to buy the baskets. In 2013, a government directive led to a ban on the giving of seasonal hampers by officials, something Kweju believes has continued to hurt businesses. Our major customers during the Christmas period were government institutions and ministries, but after a directive some years ago that government institutions should stop giving hampers to associates during Christmas, the business slumped. The government's ban on Christmas hampers were part of efforts to check corruption in the public sector. Despite the slow pace of business for the craftsmen recently, this has not put off young people who are still keen to learn the trade. I like this job because when you are focused, you can earn a decent income to take care of yourself and relatives. For many young people here, basket weaving is their main occupation. The average daily income in the past was $100 but now they are not even able to make $50 a day. As Christmas nears, many of the craftsmen like Kwejo keep themselves busy and continue to hope for the best. Nabil Ahmed Rufai, CGTN, Accra, Ghana. All right then, one last story for you, and you've been here, I've been here, we're all guilty of this. For a lot of us, non-functioning electronics, phones, damaged radios, personal computers, laptops, these are things you toss into the garbage, right? But for one Ivorian artist, this electronic waste can be turned into very interesting pieces of art. In the heart of Abidjan, the commercial capital of Côte d'Ivoire, 24-year-old Desiree Kofi goes about his daily routine. He's in search of damaged and disposed of electronics, such as phones, radios, TVs, or even computers. These are the necessary ingredients for his mixed media artwork. From aesthetically recycling the e-waste he collects, he comes up with fine artistic pieces. 
The residents here help me a lot because when they have old phones or unusable phones, they call me to come and collect them. And that was not the case before because you would find these old phones in the drain or find children playing with them which is harmful to their health. Every part of the disposed electronic can become useful. At the moment, I'm working with phone screens and keyboards, and I will use the rest of them in my painting. I keep everything. I do not throw anything away. I store them, and I will use them later. Kofi is using his art to inspire positive social change. This is a follow-up to my series to save a child, and this is a portrait of a little girl who is showing her tongue, and I try to express her joy through the colors that I used. His former teacher and fellow artist acknowledges the uniqueness of his work. I think his work is great. He was one of the best students when we were in art school. Today, he has decided to go into recycling, and it really suits him because his work stands out from all others. And I think that he's an artist with a lot of potential. Today, we talk a lot about recycling, and we like the type of work that he's doing. But also, at the back of that, you can get the graphic design aspect of his work. You can see that he is an artist who, despite incorporating recycling material into his work, he manages to capture all these forms, faces and emotions in his work, which really blew us away. Kofi's artworks fetch him at least $173 per piece. He's been able to hold several exhibitions locally and abroad. Kofi is fast becoming one of the most important figures in Cote d'Ivoire's contemporary art scene. Alexandria Majala for CGTN. All right, and I'll run through the currencies here for you before we wrap up the program. So the Kenyan shilling is still weakening slightly, but not that much. Remember, the weak point in the last 12 months is about 103.18. In today's levels, where's the current currency? There we go. 102.51, we're basically about 60 or so cents uh, from that particular level. The rand also still weakening. It's given up about 20 cents uh, to the US dollar so far today. 14.42.27 was the number. It's around 18.30 GMT. At those levels, it's about 16% in the red so far to the dollar. Those are your currencies. This has been this edition of Global Business Africa. As always, we'd like to hear your thoughts on the content we've seen here in the last hour. There's several ways of getting your thoughts back to us. All of them are on your screens right now. I'm Raman Yang in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. Thank you for your company in the last hour. The World Today is up next from Washington, D.C.